the name of Jesus. All of God's people said, This morning we're starting a series that I'm calling Knowing God. It's compatible with those that doesn't follow directly the small group study, but, but I want to capture the spirit of that as we talk about knowing God. I mentioned it actually Wednesday. I recently visited with a young, a young person, a young lady, and she was talking about her love for shopping and having new things. And I know her well enough that I just asked her, well, what, what would happen if you had to go quite a while without having anything new? She said, oh, I couldn't go one day. <laughs> really? I said, this is young lady who's a Christian. I said, well, what if Jesus were to say to you? I don't want you to buy anything for free. Anything new for free reasons. She said, well, I will do that. And here was the real, real question. I said, okay. How would you put yourself in a place where you could even hear him say that? With all the busyness, with all the full schedule, with all the activity, with all the game systems, with everything you're doing, how would you even put yourself in a place where you could hear him say to you, don't buy something in three weeks? She said, I have no idea. I think that's pretty honest, and I think that's where a lot of us Theoretically, we would say, yes, if Jesus asked me, I would do that. I'd stop doing that. I'd sacrifice that. The problem is we're so busy and we're so ignorant in some ways with spiritual things, we don't even know how to put ourselves in a place where God could even approach about that. If the burning bushes are all around and we just are so busy, we don't see them. Or if we do pause, you know, come on, let's get on with this. It's a McDonald's hamburger type of thing. We don't have time to pause very long. So knowing God, I'll talk about that for these next few weeks. How we cooperate with that. How do we, as this young lady had no idea, and I think a lot of us have no idea, how do we put ourselves in a place where we can hear God speak to us and challenge us and convict us and stretch us and whisper guidance to us. How do we do that? I want to talk about it. I want to, I want to consider this verse from 1 John 4, 7 and 8. It says, Beloved, let us love one another. For love is from God. And everyone who loves, and notice it says, is born of God and knows God. Okay, I'm not asking you to be Pentecostal. I'm not tricking you. But I want you to do something. The, the words born of God, let's lift our left hand. Born of God is left hand. Okay. Keep it up. And then, and, or rather, born, yeah, and then knows God. Okay, put the other right hand up. So, this is born of God, and this is knows God. Now, look around. This may be the closest you get to a Pentecostal service here today. <laughs> born of God and knows God. Okay, and then notice what the scripture says. The one who does not love God does not love. No, God. Put your right hand down. Leave your left hand up. Right? What's happening? Born of God, but not known. I think a lot of people where they have had an encounter, maybe at a church camp, maybe visiting with a friend, maybe in a church service, who knows where, maybe sitting <coughs> home quietly, maybe watching a minister on TV. I don't know. God knows that. But they've had a genuine, what we would call a bona fide encounter. And they've invited Christ into their lives. But like a little seed or a sapling that, that is drought ridden, that never gets the attention it needs. It, it's born of God, but it never comes to really know God. I think a lot of people are there. Where we know God, where we're born of God, rather, but we don't really know God. I think a lot of people who may have the same testimony as this young lady are in that place. Born of God, Christian, but not knowing what it means to walk with and to really know who God is. But to know who God is, we have to understand when Jesus said in John's Gospel, chapter 4, verse 24, God is spirit. God is spirit. He didn't say God is mind. He didn't say God is body. He said God is spirit. Well, spirits have spirits. God is spirit, and those who worship 
him, <clears throat> must worship him in spirit and in truth. Romans chapter 8, for all who are being led by the spirit of God, these are sons and daughters of God. The spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are God's children. A lot of Christians don't even know that the real them is a spirit. It's little wonder we don't know God very well when we don't even know the composition. God is spirit. We are spirit. We possess a soul, mind, intellect, and emotions. And we live in a body. Most of us, most of the time, are body dominated. And if we're not body dominated, we're mind or emotion dominated. In the fall, what we understand in Christian theology is that when sin happened and separation took place, what died was certainly not the physical body. That would come later. But what died <coughs> was the human spirit filled with the Holy Spirit. Dead. The Holy Spirit left the human spirit. So for generation after generation after generation, we became behaviorally <coughs> trained to go by our soul or our body. When we are now born from above, when the Holy Spirit comes into us and we are born again, the Holy Spirit comes into our human spirit, which is the, the seat of communion with God and fellowship with God. And that's where we're born from, from above, become alive. But the soul is still used to dominate. The mind and the body is still used to dominate. So we can be born of God, but not know God, because the, the mind is yet to be renewed, the body is not used to being told what to do. The spirit bears witness with our spirit. That's something that happens on the inside, because God is spirit. How many times I've heard people say, if God would just tell me open, you know? God would just make it clear to me. And people say that, think that, he just make it clear. I mean, Moses had a burning bush. That'd be handy. I'd love it to come in here on the Sabbath and the pulpit would be on fire. And I approach it, and out of it it says, Take off your shoes. This is holy ground. I would gladly take my shoes. And God would just lay on the lesson for Sunday. I'd be awesome. Awesome. It doesn't work that way for most of us, most of the time, anyway. So we, we want God to just. Because constantly talk to us in this physical realm. And we forget the cause of Jesus was to manifest the realm of God to bring us into that realm. To teach us the language of the Spirit. He manifested into this world so that He might connect with us, so that He might draw us into a different way of living. The realm of the Spirit. Of whom God is the Father. And God is so we are fundamentally spirit. So we can never get out of this crisis of <coughs> being born of God, really not knowing God, unless we realize that's the MO of God. It is moving us from this physical fixation to a spiritual reality. Hebrews says this, Therefore, since we have confidence to enter the Holy of Holies, now that's imagery of the tabernacle, author is clearly using the tabernacle as imagery for our spiritual life being drawn into God's principles. <clears throat> me. Therefore, since we have confidence to enter the Holy of Holies by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way open for us through the curtain in his body. And we know what that's talking about. When Jesus died on the cross and said, My God, why have you forsaken me? And then into your hands I commit my spirit. The minute his spirit left, the veil of the temple was torn from top to bottom. It divided the holy holy from the holy place, probably four inches thick, and it was divided from top to bottom, which symbolized access. It meant that no longer would only one high priest be able to enter the most holy place once a year, but that the right and final could never draw near. All that changed because of Jesus. We now can draw near. We may choose not to, but we are invited to draw near, to be born of God and to know God. 
And then he says, and since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God. Let us draw near. That's an invitation. That's an invitation to leave mere being born of God and to enter knowing. Let us draw near with to God with full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. So I want to use this image that the author of Hebrews is using for us to get us beyond just being born of God but to know God. And, and work with that, this image of the tabernacle. And over these next few weeks, I want to take different parts of this and understand that the holy place or the holy of holies is the goal. Now realize, we're, there's a paradox here. When we came to Christ, when Jesus came into our lives, we became the most holy place on the inside of the human spirit. So at one level, we can say positionally, we are already the holy of holies. The intersection of heaven and earth, as Dr. N.T. Wright says. We are already that positionally. The problem is, experientially, there's a wide gap between positionally who we are in Christ. <coughs> Ephesians 1, 3. <coughs> blessed is the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he or she is a new creation. Romans 8, 1 and 2. There is therefore now no condemning sentence to any who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ a second free from the law of sin and death. So the idea of being in Christ is the Holy of Holies. Positionally, that's what we are. But experientially, we can be huge distances from that. We can, we can be born of God, but not really know God. So be positionally a new creation, but experientially not walk in that at all in a way that seriously matters. I think if we take the imagery of the temple, then we can narrow the gap between positional reality and experiential reality. How do we approach God? How do we come near? How do we walk from this physical base reality into drawing the presence of God and living from the inside out, living out of the divine center? One of the prayers I pray every day as I come before God during special prayer time in my own devotion. Lord, help me to be faithful to live out of the divine center. Help me to be faithful to that. Well, this helps us with that narrowing process between positional and experiential. And so I want to begin, as we look at this, the bronze altar, they would bring a lamb or a sheep or a goat, give it to the priest, the priest would sacrifice. The bronze labor, the priest would wash out, it's, it was like a baptismal font. And then the priest would enter into the holy place, and that would have the showbread and the golden lampstand and the menorah and the altar of incense for prayer. And then the holy of holies, or the most holy place, is where the high priest only would enter once a year until the veil was torn. I want to start talking today, just for two minutes, about this bronze altar, which for us the symbol now is the cross. We come to the cross. And we come and we bring our sins before him. Now, that doesn't mean we get saved over and over and over. They're the primary sin, I, I should clarify this. <clears throat> before we become a Christian, there's one sin that separates us from God. One sin that keeps us from heaven. Not multiple sins. One sin keeps us from, from being un, unified with God. And that is the sin of unbelief, rejecting Jesus. That's the one sin. He is the Lamb who takes away the sin of the world. That rejection of Christ. Once we come to Jesus, the issue is no longer sin singular. It's sins plural. And that becomes an issue of fellowship. It becomes an issue of growing from being born of God to knowing God. Sins plural that become the issue. What I'm talking about now is Christians coming before God through the cross is an issue of sins plural. We're born from above. But we want to know God. And so we come by way of the cross and we bring the junk of our lives before. And here's what it looks like. 
in our heart, or literally, physically so, but if nothing else, in our heart, we kneel before Him. And we confess the junk in our lives. And here again, what happens if we're so busy, so preoccupied, so apathetic, so, yes, born, but so childish yet in our face, so carnal, such little saplings? What do we even confess? Yeah, God, forgive me, and this and that. And nothing seems real. How do we make that? Confessing before God the stuff in our lives. John Wesley said there are two primary manifestations of conversion. What he's saying is if you're really a Christian, these are two primary things that will happen. He said, first of all, there will be an assurance of pardon. You will know in your heart that you're a child of God. You've been pardoned by God. You're forgiven. He said the second thing is you'll start conquering sin. Now, it's Jesus in you conquering it, but you'll start living victoriously over sin. Well, the tough thing is, if we're so busy and so carnal in our faith, there are things that we're doing that aren't even issues, not even on our radar, that, oh yeah, I should be confessing to this. We do things without, <coughs> without batting an eye, without being embarrassed, because we're not on our radar. Why do think about it being sin? It's just so much a part of a polluted culture. It's like, <clears throat> we were talking about this the other day. I, I, I don't know if you experienced this or not. But when having, having Grandma Marion live with us, and she's on a two-week break from us right now, but we get her back next Sunday, having an eight-time <coughs> live with you changes your level of awareness as to what you watch on TV. You become aware that at 1 o'clock there are Viagra commercials on TV. You don't even think about it until you've got an 89-year-old sitting there with you and you're thinking, where is the remote? Can I get this thing new? <laughs> and so we were talking about that as a family. Uh, some of us as family members. <coughs> it's, like, it's like being in a polluted city. And it's just so much a part. You don't know you're sucking poison in your lungs. It's just so much there. How do we get to the point where we realize the stuff I've just been... Breathing in is actually sin. It's actually killing me. How do we get to that point where God can speak to us about the pollution that has just seemed normal to us? That's what we're talking about, learning to know God. How do we conquer sin if we're not even aware of it? Here's what I've said. <coughs> Asking God to show me the Jonah's in. You know, Dr. Phil says, let's get real. Well, I think that's, that's apropos of this discussion. Let's get real. As we kneel at the foot of the cross symbolically, and sins of selfishness, greed, and lust, that pretty much covers everything. You can find stuff that fits into all three of those categories. How do we get real with this? Well, for me, it's through understanding the opportunity. You know, you know the story. Jonah is a Jew. He's called by, <coughs> called by God to be a prophet. God speaks to him, arise, go to Nineveh, and preach repentance. What's Jonah do? He goes in the opposite direction. Now, why is that? Because Nineveh is the capital city of Assyria. Assyria is like Nazi Germany in the 1940s to Jonah. He hates Assyria. He doesn't want them to repent. He wants no mercy for this group of people. So he leaves. He flees from God. And he goes and he finds a ship going in the opposite direction. The plan is to say that whenever we run from God, Satan will always have the ship. Going in the other direction. So Jonah gets on the, the cruise towards Tarshish. And everything's going cool. He's enjoying the food. The captain's nice. Worldly stuff. It's all fine. So he goes down and he's going to sleep for a while. But while he's in the bottom deck, the ship starts going through a storm. And these are seasoned sailors, but this is a storm like they've never seen. And they become terrified as the, as the sky grows dark and the winds boisterous and the waves humongous. And they're fearful for their lives. And so they cast lots, it's sort of like playing Nazi with people's names in it. And Jonah's name comes up. <clears throat> And they run down and they get him and they say, what's the deal? And he say, well, you're right, you need to get rid of me. Oh, we can't do that. So they start throwing cargo. <coughs> they 
done that. Where God's wanting the joke, <coughs> but instead we offer the car. I want Jonah out here. That's the thing I'm dealing with. No, I don't have time for that. So we give him, well, I'll serve on this committee. I'll do this. I'll give you that. I'll read more here. I'll, I'll study more here. I'm going to throw cargo over to you. God wasn't interested. He could care squat about the cargo. Come on, Jonah. They kept dealing with this incredible storm, fearing more and more for their lives at the minute. So finally, they did all they knew to do. They got Jonah. They said, sorry, but you got to go. And they threw him over. Immediately. Now, what was good for the crew was really lousy for Jonah. Jonah is now in the depth of the sea, and he gets swallowed by a great fish, a <coughs> whale. I know how to get theology of what it was, but it was something God prepared. We call it a whale. And this whale swallowed him. Jonah is now in this weird, surreal state in the belly of the whale. I mean, he starts coming to himself. He has seaweed on his face. There's a, there's a partly decayed squid looking at him. He's just oozing with plankton all over the place. And this is crazy. You know, where am I? And it stinks. It stinks. Awful stench. Like he's never smelled it. But he stays there for a while. Yeah, has that ever happened to you? Where maybe you've run from God. You, you've drifted. And for a while, you're willing to put up with the stench. You know, it's it, all kinds of junk. Spiritual seaweed in your life and decaying squid and plankton. But you put up with it. And you can have so much more. Haven't we all done that? And finally, maybe you've been in a place in your life where you become sick and tired of being sick and tired. That was Jonah. And Jonah cried out to God. How He cried out to God. You might think, Jonah, you missed it too, too big. You, you just flat out disobeyed God. You can't expect God to meet you in the belly of a whale. You can't expect God to meet you in that brothel. You can't expect God to meet you in that bar. You've got to go to a church first. But Jonah didn't have the luxury of going to the church. He was caught between seaweed and, and decaying squid. And he cried out. Beloved, no matter what mistake you ever made. Have you ever, maybe you tied one on and you woke up with a humdinger of a headache and you know, well, what can I do? But have you ever awakened with seaweed on your face and decaying squid looking at you and covered with plant? Whatever you've done, God knows. And wherever you are, God already is there. He is the God who was there. And he cried out. And something happened. It's called revival. In the belly of a whale, God began to move in Jonah's life. And as you read the second chapter of Jonah, Jonah becomes shouting and happy. He is restored to God. He's fellowshipping with God. It's incredible. With the seaweed and the squid and the plankton, God shows up on the sea. Jonah gets it right with God, and Jonah is restored. And then God whispers to the well. Sometimes God gets us back on track, but it's not the most glorious way. The well double parks at the beach, and he vomits Jonah up. <laughs> there he is. So there he's standing on the beach, covered with seaweed, maybe a partial decayed squid on his arm, feet filled with but he's free, and he's excited. And the first thing God says, now Jonah, arise and go to Nineveh. You see, God may restore us, but God doesn't forget the mission. God may have to get us out of the pit. He may have to reclaim us, but remember we're his kids. Because I'm born of him. I may not know him very well, but I'm his kid. I've been born of him. And Jonah was his kid. He'd been born of him, if you will. And even though he was in the belly of a whale and filled with sewage, he was still a kid of God. And when he cried out, the father heard. 
But the Father also doesn't forget your first call. Maybe some of us in this place have not done what God's asked us to do. We, we've fudged on it. We've been apathetic towards it. We've drifted from it. God's calling us. As you come back to God and God's forgiven you, God's restored you, God's cleaned you up, God hasn't forgotten what He's called you to do. Now arrive. How do we make that? That's what confession is. The Jonas in our lives, not the cardinal. I'm glad you can't name the sins I need to repent of, and I can't name the ones you need to repent of, because I'm innocent. I don't know your Jonah. You don't know my Jonah. What I can do is get real with God and say, Lord, as I fall to the foot of the cross, as I enter into his presence, God, I don't know what all the Jonas are, but I want to get real. And I want to surrender the Jonas of my life. So let's take these two hands, and let's put them on our legs like this, palms down. And let's invite the Holy Spirit to do it. Holy Spirit, you know what the Jonas are. You know our self deceptions You know the games we play and all of that. But Lord, we're asking to get real. And we ask you now to show us the Jonas in our lives. Holy Spirit, you show us. My wife's not going to show me. My husband's not going to show me. My best friend's not going to show me. My pastor's not going to show me. Holy Spirit, you show me. What's my Jonas? What are my Jonas? Now, Holy Spirit, as you reveal those things to us, help us to just surrender them. So, beloved, while your hands are turned down, palms down, I want you just to imagine now the Holy Spirit pouring out of you all the junk, all the seed weed of your life, the decaying things of your life, all the poison that you've exposed yourself to. Just imagine that being poured out of you. And let go of those Jonas, those Jonas that you've been hiding. Holy Spirit, pour them out of this world. <clears throat> Thank you, Jesus. I confess them to Jesus. Confess them to Jesus. Now let's turn our palms up on our laps. It's palms up. Now, Holy Spirit, cleanse us. Clean us up. Forgive us. Restore us. And now imagine the Holy Spirit just in a unlimited way. An audacious way, just pouring upon you grace and love and mercy and cleansing and forgiveness and his calling to you because you're his kid. You've been born of him, even if you haven't known him very well. And this vision, that grace being poured into you, the Holy Spirit just pouring into you, restoring your life. Lord, we give you praise. Lord God, we give you praise. Hallelujah. For cleaning us up. For calling us out of the pit. For restoring our lives in Jesus. And for renewing our call our bodies. Go to them. In Jesus' name we pray. Beloved, let's celebrate his name. Just stand and sing with the